believe that it's losing. So I like this cartoon to start off just because it's kind of funny and it has to do with telescopes. Telescopes are our window to the universe, if you want to be lame. So what is the difference between Nova and Supernova? What is the difference between us, Nova and a Supernova? First of all, what does the word Nova mean? And we're not talking two words in Spanish. Um, Nova means new. So Nova originally meant a new star. Now, what was that based on? That's based on I looked in the sky yesterday or last week or last month, and that star wasn't there, and now it is. And so they called it a nova to say there's a new star there. Well, one of the things about these novi, novi is plural for nova, is that the novi were transient. They were there for a few months, and then they faded away. And then upon further study, they found that there were distinctly different types and so now we have a clear definition. A nova is a white dwarf that had enough gas on its exterior that it suddenly had a huge nuclear explosion on its exterior. A supernova is a very massive star that collapsed completely. So they're, they're fundamentally very different. They are both in death stages. So that wasn't the goal here. It was just to appreciate that they're looking at a telescope and we have those designations. So telescopes. Today we're going to learn about telescopes and the different types. So we had some pictures in the spectrum of, you know, this type of telescope and that. Here we're going to look at it a little more carefully. But before we get started, we want to talk about how the telescopes fundamentally work. Here's a picture of a bunch of telescopes, right? One, two, three. There's three in this picture or at least three domes. Those domes serve a purpose. The domes serve a purpose of, number one, keeping it roughly constant temperature, shielding it from the weather. and number two, shielding it from the weather. So with those domes, it's not actually part of the observing, it's part of protecting it. They want to keep those telescopes, the temperature it's going to be outside all day long. So um, what was it, last year? Um, Elena Cornwell. You guys know Elena Cornwell? Okay, so her dad and I went to high school together, and he worked for a number of years up here in Hawaii working on the telescopes, I believe as a technician. Those are the people who are actually in there with the telescopes, right, because the scientists aren't. And he said it's really cold in there because they're at the top of a mountain, and at night it gets really cold, and so they keep the temperature in there. The temperature is going to be at nighttime because metals expand and contract with temperature. Almost everything does, but metals more than a lot of materials. And they don't want things expanding and contracting when they open the dome, so they keep the temperature what it's going to be when they open it. Which I figure is pretty good because it's always easier to put on a coat than it is to you know, deal with hot. And unlike what, well, I said this, unlike what you tend to think, they don't really use the eye for observing. Back in the olden days, you know, like when I was a child, they would take pictures and you'd have photographic plates. And so if you were looking for something changing in the sky, for instance, let's say you're looking for a, um, for a comet, they would use a flip camera where you have one picture you took one night and one picture you took maybe a week later. And you have a little mirror that you flip back and forth. So you see one picture, then the other back and forth, and you're looking for the change between them. To me, that would be very frustrating and tedious work. Yes, now you can have a computer do it, which is much easier. Because now, instead of using film, we use the same thing that you have in your cell phone camera for taking a picture, except for it's bigger. Now, just in case you're wondering, your cell phone camera, what do you have? You have a charge couple device. We call it charge couple device, actually for the way it reads the data. But what it is is a silicon wafer. And that silicon wafer is broken up into little picture cells. So short for picture cell is pixel. So there's a picture cell. And each one of those picture cells actually does a simple job. You have a piece of metal and light hits the metal. And when light, now I'm, I'm saying metal, this is actually silicon wafer, so it's silicon. But we usually talk about for metals because that's how it was discovered. So when light hits that material, 
it will give electrons enough energy that they get shot off. And so this material suddenly is missing an electron. So it has a positive charge. You, what do you call it when you take an electron away from an atom? Ionize. So you've ionized an atom. And so for every photon that hits, you ionize an atom. And so each one of those little picture cells essentially is counting how many photons hit it by, by how much charge it has lost. And so you have a set time that you just let it sit there and collect data. And then you say, okay, time to read it. Now when it's time to read it, it goes blind. But you actually use, see these little things that say voltage electrodes, read out electrodes. These voltage electrodes are used to actually march the charge states over one at a time. And then when they get out here to the end, they read out the charge state. So it reads the charge state for the entire line. Then you shift them over one, and you read it again. And so it goes through and reads all the charge states and resets it. That's what's going on in your cell phone when you take a picture. And that's what's going on with the camera that astronomers use. What's the difference between the cell phone camera and the one astronomers use? Yeah, yeah, theirs is better. It's bigger. Bigger. Now, when we say bigger, the pixel sizes themselves is one of the things. The pixels are very, very tiny on your cell phone which means that you actually could have, you know, if the focus isn't perfect, then you have the data going on more than one cell. On the ones that are used for astronomy, they're gonna be bigger pixels, and it's a much bigger overall chip, right? The overall chip in your camera is very small. Now, some cameras have opted to go a little more expensive and use a bigger chip. So there was a Nokia camera, I think it came out a year or two ago, that had a chip that was like twice as big as the chips in most cell phones. And because of that, with exact same quality of optics, you could get a better picture. So they're trying to use, you know, the best they can in astronomy. And you'll have chips in astronomy that are taking, you know, 100 megapixel pictures. What does mega mean? Million. million. So 100 million picture cells on that chip. It's a huge amount of data. Did you have a question, Amanda? Or <clears throat> Hannah? No. Okay. Sorry about that. It's the second time. What's good about the CCD? Well, number one is you notice this 75% efficiency. The photography using traditional film was only about 10% efficient. So you're getting about seven to eight times more light that you're measuring for the same coming in. That means you'll be able to measure fainter things. Another easy thing is exposure. Anyone who's worked with film knows that getting that exposure right is a problem, right? If you expose it too long, you just have, it's all washed out. If you don't expose it long enough, it's all black and you can't see anything. You've got to get it right. With the CCDs, you have a digital signal and you can always see the picture. If it's overexposed, your contrast is going to get diminished, but you'll still be able to see the picture. If it's underexposed, your contrast is diminished, you'll be able to see the picture. If you expose it just right, well, you have it there. So you have that aspect of you can always see the picture. Another aspect, it's very easy to do multiple um, frames. You could take one picture for 20 seconds and you're like, ooh, that's underexposed. You know, take another one for 20 seconds, another one for 20 seconds. You can just add them all together and get much more detailed picture. So it's easy to combine them. It's easy to work with them on computers. There's virtually nothing that's not better about using the CCD. So it's a real big step up for astronomers doing their research. As you see right there, revolutionized astronomy. We're gonna look at things outside the visible spectrum primarily. And so we're looking at things like this here. Any idea what's going on? Okay, I'm gonna erase that because that kind of detracts from the picture. Any idea what's going on in this picture? Something separate. Something separate. Now, this is not visible light. This is electromagnetic radiation outside of the visible spectrum. And the first thing to understand when we look at radiation outside the visible spectrum is, by definition, we cannot see it. Which means, by definition, there's no color associated with it. 
So you look up here and you see the pretty colors. What do those colors mean? And before you try to answer, they mean whatever the renderer wants them to mean. They could use the Doppler effect information to, deter, to indicate the speed in which it's traveling. In this case, I don't think that's the case because it would be bluish on one side, reddish on the other if they were using the Doppler shift information. It could be the temperature. It could be the types of gas. So anytime you see one of these photographs that's not visible light, you have to, uh, you have to look for what do the colors mean you just can't look at it and say, ah, that's this beautiful thing. What's happening in this picture, right there you have your object. Um, it likely is. I, I can't say. I'd have to look at the description. I think I have a description here. And it's shooting off two jets. We call it a bipolar jet. And those jets are hitting gas out here, which is you know causing a shock wave and that's what you're seeing out here is the shock wave where that jet is hitting gas yeah huh um i'm not gonna go with the pulsar I, i'm not gonna take your money either but <laughs> pretty sure it's not a pulsar um i it's probably an active galactic nucleus you know like a c for galaxy or something like that this here is no that's a supernova remnant but that's not a pulsar um okay this right here could be a pulsar yeah but the whole thing okay but looking at these are looking for information outside the visible spectrum so let's look specifically at the kinds of telescopes that we have and why we would want to look in the different ranges. So here's one of the first cool pictures. This picture here is of the Crab Nebula. And the story with this I think is really cool. Back in 1054, what does CE mean? Common Era or more generally it's called AD which is in the year of our Lord, um, after the death of Christ, is what we usually use for A.D. But. And so 1054 A.D., a little less than 1,000 years ago, Chinese astronomers noticed a new star, but they didn't call it a nova because you know what? They weren't, they weren't people who spoke Latin. So they just called it a guest star, of course, in Chinese. And they noted it's here in the constellation that we know as Taurus. And then when astronomers developed nice telescopes, well, not nice telescopes, not to the level we have, but in 1731, I've got to stop circling things. A telescope was aimed to the region that the Chinese had observed this guest star, and they saw this cloud. Now, the Latin word for cloud is nebula. And so we call it a nebula. And they said, wow, there's a cloud there where the Chinese saw a guest star. I wonder if the two are related. And of course, going through the scientific method, something you're going to have to have you know, down for the test that's coming up. The first thing, what's the first part of the scientific method? Observe something interesting. Well, that's interesting. The Chinese said there was a guest star, now we see this cloud. What's the next step? A hypothesis that is based on scientific ideas that can explain why this observation occurred and makes testable predictions. So pretend you're the astronomer. I mean, you go back to 1731, their astronomy knowledge was probably not much different than your astronomy knowledge coming into this class. So what would you guess is going on between the Chinese seeing a guest star and you seeing this cloud now? Okay, so Russell says an explosion. Does that make sense? You don't have, okay, you got a few supporters of you, Russell. Okay, if you had an explosion, you'd have to, you know, like, how could it explode? Why would a star explode? 
I really need to have something that's based on scientific ideas. Well, maybe that's not one of the scientific ideas we'll have. But we do know that things can explode, and when they explode, they move out, right? And so what's a possible test? You could test this to say, does this look like it could have been an explosion that occurred? At that point, it was you know, roughly 690 years ago. How would you test that? If you were in 1731 or now. If you what? Like in 1731 or, or if what, like present day. Either way. Just, just a way to test your hypothesis. I mean, you could, like, maybe see, like, look at the light from other stars and see what their composite, like, nearby stars and see what their composition is and compare that with the gas cloud and see if they're made of the same. Okay. Compare the composition. That's, a, that's an advanced idea there. Compare the composition of other stars nearby. Any other ideas? The idea that scientists use was not nearly as complicated. They said, well, if it exploded, it went boom and things went outward. And so let's measure the size it is today and how rapidly it's expanding and extrapolate backwards. Say it's always had that speed, right? First rough estimate. And extrapolate how old it would be before, you know, how long ago it exploded based on its size and expansion. You know, kind of like if I've been driving on the road at 80 miles an hour and I am 2,000 miles from here, you can say, okay, well, assuming he's been driving at 80 miles an hour the entire time, then the distance he's traveled is, and just take the, um, the wait, which one did I give you? I gave you the distance. The time he's traveled then is going to be the distance divided by the speed. And so then they said, okay, let's do it. How could you find the speed at which it's expanding? I'll, I'll give you a hint. You can't say, well, let's measure the size today. Let's measure the size tomorrow. That's not going to work. Because it's not expanding fast enough for the angle to appreciably change. I will today in 10 years from now. Do what? Today in 10 years from now. Okay, today in 10 years from now. But we want to do it now. I don't want to wait 10 years to find out. How about we can use the Doppler shift? We can use the Doppler shift to see how fast things are moving towards the front. Say, okay, move towards the front, go that way. If we can then use that and determine the distance to it, we can find the time. And actually, in doing that, they found that, hey, that predicted that this should have started with the explosion at roughly the time that the Chinese astronomers noticed the guest star. And so that was their first piece of concluding, yeah, that nebula must have been the result of a guest star, which we would call now a supernova. Now, if you look at the crowd nebula, you can see different details depending on what kind of telescope you use. Now, the colors here are clearly not the same colors. This here is definitely false color. And if you look at it, if you look at this here, what do you notice about the detail? How do the details compare? Are they equal in their details that they show? No. This one here has much more detail. This one here has less detail. It turns out that using different wavelengths, you get different amounts of detail. The larger the wavelength, the smaller the res or the poorer the resolution. That's the less detail you see. So if you're using a radio telescope, this one here is probably radio, you don't see much detail at all. If you're using something that's visible light, you see good detail. Ultraviolet light, you could e see even better because it's a shorter wavelength. And so, yeah, it's been steady with virtually all ranges. Modern telescopes are almost exclusively telescopes like this that are reflectors. If you look at this, this is the Keck telescope. It's a twin telescope. You had a homework problem that talked about these. Do you remember how big each one of those mirrors is in the Keck telescope? 
I'll give you a clue. It's not what my hands are doing. You can look at the size of that dome to realize that. Or you could look at, the, I think, oh, no, that's not okay. From your homework problem, those are 10 meter diameter mirrors. They're really big. Why do you suppose it has two of them? Kind of. There are two really good reasons. Reason number one is you're collecting twice as much light. You're looking at faint things. The bigger your collecting area, the more light you can gather. In fact, they call big telescopes light buckets because it's like putting a bucket out in the rain. The bigger the telescope, the more light it can gather. And so here's the first thing about telescopes. Like if you're going to buy a telescope for yourself, the first thing is bigger is better. Because the collecting efficiency or the light gathering power is proportional to the area of your opening. So if you have a bigger mirror, you can have a bigger area. Area is pi times radius squared. So that's proportional to the radius squared or proportional to the diameter squared, if you want to put it in terms of diameter. So you double the size of your telescope and you get four times as much lighting. And in astronomy, it's actually not magnification that is limiting you on what you see. It's how much light you can collect. So bigger is better. There's a second thing. The resolution is inversely proportional to... The opening that is the bigger the opening, the smaller the detail you can see, which is better. So bigger also allows you to see more fine detail. So there's one reason to have the twin telescopes. The second one is you can use what we call interferometry. You can take the picture from each one and Arwen, Alwin, wow, screwed that one up, <laughs> said binocular vision. Well, you take those two pictures and you superpose them on top of each other. Superpose, superpose mean the same thing in case people are wondering about my English. You superpose them on top of each other and you can actually get better resolution by doing that. You get resolution equivalent to if you had a telescope that was as big as the separation between the two. So there is another good reason for having the two telescopes. So this is a visible light telescope. Notice it has a mirror. I don't think, nope, I don't have it here. There are two fundamental types of visible telescopes. There, I'm sure it's coming up in another lecture, but it's not in today's, and I want to make sure I cover it before you do the homework. So we have, actually, it's got to be in today's because it's, this is what the clicker question is. You have reflectors and refractors. A reflector uses a mirror. A refractor uses a lens. Refraction is a physics word that means light bends when it goes from one material into another. So you probably notice like when somebody's in a swimming pool, you look at them and their head's above water and you see their head like normal, but then from their waist down to in the water, it looks like their legs are going sideways. It's because the light bends, so the light that came from their feet comes up like this and then it comes out at a different angle. You extrapolate back, it looks to you like their feet are a different place than they really are. So that's what refraction is. We have a couple of students here wearing eyeglasses. There's probably more who are wearing contact lenses. And all of us have eyes we're using. Those, all of those rely on refraction, light bending, to focus the light. And so we can use lenses to focus the light. But as you had with the very last homework problem, it talks about the weight of the lenses. A refractor that uses lenses if you want to make it big so you can collect a lot of light, it's going to be really heavy. And everybody knows that glass flows. Of course, it flows very slowly. But it does flow. And if you have really heavy glass, it's going to flow a lot more. So the big lenses that be so heavy, they would actually start to deform under their own weight. And so you have problems just maintaining the integrity of your lens if you make a big refractor. Furthermore, you have to grind two surfaces on the lens, the front surface and the back surface. Two surfaces, 
That's twice as hard as a mirror where you only have to grind one surface. So refractors have the disadvantage of being heavy. They have the disadvantage of having two surfaces. And then there's a few more that are more subtle. One of the cool advances in astronomy since I've been a teacher, right, the last 21 years, is the development of adaptive optics. They now have telescopes that will adjust their shape of their mirror to adjust for the atmosphere causing light to go in random directions. Well, not random, but to do this. And so they can actually improve by about a factor of 10 the resolution. That's so they can see about detail one-tenth as small, smaller detail, by using these adaptive optics, which is changing the shape of a mirror. You can't do that with a lens. Finally, two more things. The lens is always going to have some absorption of light, which means you're going to lose some light just in the lens. And lenses focus different colors differently. And so your lens will have what we call chromatic aberration. Chroma is color. Aberration is an error in the focus. They'll have chromatic aberration because blue light might focus here and red light focus here. But we want them to focus the same place. You don't have that problem with the mirror. So there's really, there, there's no redeeming qualities for the lenses, except for cheaper. You know, a small lens is cheaper than, than a small mirror for whatever reason. So almost all research grade telescopes are reflectors like this. Now we're going to get to non-visible light telescopes. I've never been to Puerto Rico. But in Puerto Rico, they have the world's biggest telescope, this Arecibo telescope. And the Arecibo telescope is 305 meters across. Since a meter is just a little bit more than a yard, we're talking three football fields across. Okay, so my football fields are progressive in length. But you could basically fit three football fields across that telescope. It's huge. Why is it so huge? Because it's measuring radio waves which have long wavelengths. Long wavelengths, you have very poor resolution. But you can improve the resolution by having a bigger telescope. Also, those radio waves are very, very weak. And so you need to have a very large telescope to collect a strong enough signal. And so there's two reasons for it to be very big. Has anyone here seen the movie Goldeneye? Okay, one person. It's a James Bond movie. Came out just about the time I started teaching. One of the things that really cracked me up was their scene at the Arecibo telescope. They, uh, they, they have a big epic fight there in the telescope. The telescope was hidden by them flooding it with water in the movie. And the water is being drained so they can use it. And as they're draining it, the sides of the telescope are dry just about a foot above the water level, continuously. I'm like, water doesn't dry that quick. But it gets better. When they get to the bottom, they have a drain at the center of it. Of course, this was done with the model. They have a drain at the center. And the water goes <laughs> and jumps down into the drain. What, what happened there in the film? What did they do? They were filming it and filmed it being filled. And then they just ran the film backward to show it draining. And nobody stopped to think that it's not the same. In physics, we talk about the second law of thermodynamics and one of those things with the second law is it says things don't work the same forward and backward. And that was an example of, they didn't think about it. There's another, I've never seen this, but there's a famed example where they want to have two people on the beach at, it was like, you know, sunset and it was supposed to be on the East coast, but they were filming on the West coast. So they said, well, let's just have them not do any walking and film it at sunrise and run it backward. They thought it was great until they went and screened it. And everybody started laughing at the birds that were flying backward in the background. <laughs> okay, so that, that wasn't, that's physics, but that's not astronomy. So this Arecibo telescope, what do you use it for? 
Um, oh, look, there's where I have the collecting area. You use it for looking at things like neutral hydrogen dust clouds. And later on, I think I'll have a picture of what Jupiter looks like from this telescope compared to what Jupiter looks like in a visible telescope so you can see the differences. There is additional information that you don't see at the visible telescope, but it's very poor resolution. Okay, here's where we talked about the collecting area, the light gathering power. And so since area is pi times radius squared, that makes it um, pi times diameter squared over four. So bigger allows you to see fainter things. That's the reason to make big collecting areas. This is just, I, I haven't paid much attention to the filtering, but one thing that they will do is use filters so they see just one color. And it's not making a color, it's just filtering out other colors. You're seeing only the light that's in this range. And common filters are I for infrared, R for red, B for blue, U for ultraviolet, and V for verde, <laughs> uh, for green. So those are used to allow you to, to limit the light you're looking at and compare. Refraction, I thought, yes, Max. So the filters, um, when you say only allows one type of light to pass, does that mean it absorbs all wavelengths except for specific? Right, there, we, we call these notch filters, which means it blocks everything except for this range. That's exactly correct. Okay, here's an example of refraction. I like to use my own examples like, you know, when you're at the beach, if you're on the nice cement sidewalk, you can walk at a nice rate or you can ride a bicycle at a nice speed. But if you're in the sand, you go much slower. So if you're renting the little four wheel bicycle thing for the family, by the way, we had like four people in there and they all said, let Richard, it's not so easy to pedal four people, it turns out. Oh, tandem Well, it, it's, now there are Jags and Hunting Beach. They have the little things that have, you know, it's, it's basically like a carriage or something. You know, two rear wheels, two front wheels, so you can, nothing can go wrong. And <laughs> anyway, so if you're taking that down the concrete and you're not paying attention and you shear off into the sand, what's going to happen to the wheels that hit the sand? They slow way down. And when they slow way down, what's going to happen to the direction you're traveling? It's going to change. Which way are you going to turn? You're going to turn, if I'm, you know, just imagine that you are holding an iron grip going straight with that steering wheel. Is it going to turn back toward the concrete sidewalk or is it going to turn toward the sand? Because the side that hit the sand slowed down, it's going to turn into the sand. And that's exactly what light does. When light goes from a material where it travels faster, it travels the fastest in a vacuum, slower than everything else. When it turn, goes into something slower, it turns into it. And so if you have a piece of glass, light comes and hits that glass, and instead of going straight, it will turn into it. So we call that refraction. And on Friday, I'll do some demonstrations on this just to make sure you've seen it in action. But that's the fundamental thing that makes a mirror focus. So here's the example, like I showed, of a person standing in water. I already talked about it. I'm going to skip that. The whole reason you have chromatic aberration is this right here. The colors spread out. When I was a little kid, first grade, when we finished our homework, as a reward, our teacher would let us play with a prism. And while most of my classmates were doing this, holding up, laying the light shine through on the wall, saying, ooh, look at the pretty rainbows, I was holding up to my eyes, say, oh, the world's upside down, trying to walk around. Because I was destined to be a scientist. But that separation of light we call dispersion, different colors have actually different speeds in the glass. And because they have different speeds, they have different amounts that they refract. And so when light goes through a prism, the colors get separated both at the front surface and then again at the rear surface to spread them out so you can see all of the colors. Now in class we wore little glasses that use slits. The slits are using what we call diffraction, light bending around corners. Whereas the lens is using refraction, light bending because of change in speed. So this dispersion is a negative for a lens, 
because it causes a blurring effect, what I already named the chromatic aberration. <laughs> How does the lens work? How does the lens work is a pretty sophisticated topic for an introductory class, right? But let's start with something basic. If I have a prism and I have light that comes into that prism, because it's going slower in the prism, it's going to bend into the prism. So instead of going straight through like that, the light is instead going to bend more directly into it. When it comes out, it's now going into something that goes faster. When it goes faster, it bends away. So when it goes faster, it's going to bend like that instead of going straight. So it bends on both surfaces. And so if I have light that hits the top of the prism, it's going to bend down toward the bottom when it comes out. Well, a lens is made by essentially taking that idea and putting a prism on top and a prism on bottom that are oppositely shaped. So the prism on top could be that red one, and then I'll make a green prism on bottom. And so if I have light that comes into the green prism, okay, that was beautiful. It goes like that. Now my picture's horrible, but the light comes together. Parallel light rays meet because they went through those two prisms. Now to make a mirror, you don't just use two prisms. You have continuously changing curvature to give you effectively the whole thing as part of the prism. And so the way the lens works is parallel incoming light. So parallel light would be <laughs> black, not the color to choose there. Here's parallel incoming light. It bends. Um, did I choose the right one? Nope, I didn't choose the right one. And comes to a focus there. Now, I have a different set of parallel lines that are coming at a different angle. And so these here bend differently. And they come to a focus as well, but at a different location. And so depending on the angle of the lights coming from, you have a focus at different locations allowing you to see, you know, this stuff that was up high, the light came at this angle, this stuff that was lower came at another angle. And you have an image that's produced from that light. But notice the white in my picture was coming from higher position. And where is it on my focal plane, higher or lower? Binary question. Did it come together higher or lower location? My question is, is the white above or below the green? Below. So the light that was coming in from above came to a focus on the focal plane below. So the lens is going to invert your image. It's going to give you an image that's upside down. And once again, on Friday, we'll do some demonstrations to see all of this in action so that it's not just, well, he said it so. Because after all, that's indoctrination if I just say, I say it so, you must believe. Right? We want to have as much as we can, you being convinced. But that's what a lens is doing. It's making the light come together and light from different locations comes to a focus, comes together at different locations. <sighs> that's a long telescope, isn't it? Another advantage of the reflector over the refractor is the reflector, the light basically is going in a straight path. A refractor, you're reflecting light, or re, did I say it backwards? A refractor light is essentially going in a straight path. That is with lenses. So you have two lenses, one's here, one's here. Light goes through the first lens, goes through the second lens, and gets to my eye. If you're using a reflector, you have a mirror, light comes and hits that mirror, and then you usually put a second mirror, and then you observe back here. So the light comes and it actually starts back here. It doesn't start at the beginning of the telescope, it starts at the back side for the telescope's path. But then it goes from here up to the second mirror and back. So you folded the light. So your telescope only has to be half as long with the reflector compared to with the refractor. So there's yet another advantage. You can make a smaller telescope. 
Hence the Hubble Space Telescope. What type of telescope do you suppose it would be or is? Reflector or refractor? It's a reflector. And the Webb Space Telescope, what will it be? Reflector. It will be a reflector, but it's going to be a huge reflector. I'm really excited because, of course, it's the James Webb Space Telescope, but we don't have to talk about James. It's, just, it's the Webb it's the, That's right. So if anybody asks, it's your telescope. That's right. That's right. I got you. I'll so, it's yours too. Okay. <laughs> you'll, you'll be my witness. Yeah. Okay. So um, the reflector uses a primary mirror. Now, this is odd because it's just showing the mirror focusing. You don't just have a single lens or a single mirror, right? This picture showed a single lens. For a telescope, you have two lenses, two mirrors, not just one. But it's showing you how you focus light with a mirror. Once again, on Friday, I'll have all the toys out. We'll probably spend all day with toys on Friday and very little lecture time. Most of it's show and tell time. So we can see how these things actually form an image. A big advantage that I didn't say for the mirrors is they can be supported from behind. You can hold a mirror from behind. You can hold the entire mirror and not have to block any light. Now, the mirrors do usually have a hole in the center because you actually have a second mirror that reflects light through that hole in the center. So you lose that little amount of area, but you don't block area with it. So here's the design for reflectors where you can see the folding of light. This here is a primary focus. You just have one mirror, it focuses, and you have your camera there. As far as I know, that's not used in astronomy. But it's the simplest focusing you can have with a single mirror. The second design there, it has a secondary mirror, and that's called the Cassegrain design. You see the word Cassegrain here for Cassegrain focus. This is the design that's used in virtually all telescopes for research. You have your primary mirror is back here. Primary means it's the first one the light hits. It's the one that does the majority of the focusing. Then you have a secondary mirror here that is reflecting the light through a hole to not where your head is. Now, I have a cast grain that we'll bring out when we go to um, <laughs> Gary's house. Really going to figure out his last name soon. Walter, that's it, Gary Walter's house. And so we will be looking through it. But if you're doing research, you're not going to be looking here. You're going to have your CCD chip back there for looking. This here is a Newtonian telescope. What's different about the Newtonian? Instead of the light going through a hole in the back of the mirror, of the primary mirror, this mirror reflects it out to the side. So if you have a telescope and the eyepiece is in the side of the tube near the front of it, that's a Newtonian design. If the eyepiece is coming out the back of the telescope and it's a reflector, that's a cast grain design. So it's easy to tell the difference. Um, I haven't really thought about the benefits or disadvantages of the Newtonian versus the cast grain. I just know the cast grain is the dominant design. That's a visible telescope. We have the radio telescope. Actually, I'm going to go back to the radio telescope, maybe. There it is, the radio telescope. How does this radio telescope focus any kind of electromagnetic radiation? As far as you can see, it's just a big concrete dish. Well, who's ever seen a concrete dish used for reflecting? Well, it has to have something conducted in its surface. But as you have from one of the homework problems, you have wavelengths that are like, let's say, a meter long that you're looking at. If you're looking at wavelengths a meter long, you can have a grid that's 10 centimeters square of your reflecting material, and as far as the light can tell, that's a smooth surface. That's why back in the day, the big ugly dish, you have a satellite dish in your backyard that's eight feet in diameter, eight feet so it can pick up a weak signal. You would often have it made out of a grid of wire so air can blow through it. As long as you have those holes, 
like one-tenth the wavelength you're looking at, it's not a problem. So it has this reflector down there and then hanging up at the top right here, that's where its camera is. That's where it's actually receiving and making its image. So we get here to our X-ray telescope. The X-ray telescope is a completely different design. That radio telescope was very similar, really, to the primary focus telescope that was a reflector. This here, because X-rays are so high energy, we can't design the same type of telescope. So this is made using little plates with voltages to, to direct the light and make it a focus. So X-ray telescopes are really, really complicated. Why would you use an X-ray telescope? These look at very high energy, so very hot things. You can look at the light from very hot things with an X-ray telescope. With a radio telescope, you can look at the light from very cold things. And you can get different details from them. So here's our one and only clicker question. So you can answer starting now. What type of visible light telescope is used predominantly for scientific investigations? <laughs> I, by the way, think I'm very funny with my answers. Yeah, it's better to think you're funny than, I don't know. All right, everybody's answered. And it's the perfect number for graduating from high school, 8484. Let's have Latifer. Tell us what the difference is in the two types that people chose and which one you selected and why. The refractor bins the one right. the reflector the Okay. So I chose the reflector because I don't know what it takes. Yeah. I can change it. Okay. Well she's definitely right on the difference between a refractor and a reflector. The reflector uses a mirror to reflect light, a refractor uses a lens to bend light. And so in research telescopes, it is the reflector, the one you guessed, that is the dominant, predominant, like well over 90%. There's really only one refractor that I can think of, all the rest reflectors. The reasons are a plethora, smaller length. Lighter pieces. No chromatic aberration. I aberration might have two Bs. I think it, I don't know. Don't remember. Um, and the list goes on. There's a number of things easier to hold. You can adapt it so you can use adaptive optics. All those things are good reasons why reflectors are the dominant telescope in um, in science. This is the last slide. Here you can see a mosaic mirror. See the pieces of mirror here? Those pieces of mirror are designed so each one is on its own actuator. So each one can be individually moved so they can adjust the actual shape of the telescope by adjusting those things. Okay, so we end here.